Up to this point, we've looked at ideal solutions, binary solutions, and we ended last time uh, learning about fractional distillation and how the relationships between chemical potential, fundamentally, and vapor pressures, Dalton's laws and Raoul's laws, I guess they both just have one law, Dalton's law and Raoul's law, permit one to predict and rationalize fractional distillation. Now I want to look at solutions that are not ideal. And not surprisingly, they're called non-ideal solutions. And a non-ideal solution is defined by its deviation from Raoul's law behavior. So here is an example, then, of a uh, composition diagram. It is one for carbon disulfide and dimethyl ether. One smells incredibly foul and is viciously flammable. Uh, the other one doesn't smell so bad. But anyway, mix them together. And what you see is positive deviation from Raoul's law. So here's the usual. I'll plot the mole fraction of one of them. I'm not actually sure which one this is. I guess if I looked at it, I could figure it out. Looks like it's dimethyl ether, because carbon disulfide's more volatile. I might have to go look that up in a handbook. But it's not important. Bottom line is, were these to follow Raoul's law, we would expect to see linear behavior in the vapor pressure of the component with its increase in mole fraction. Instead, when we look at the vapor pressures, in this case, we see a positive deviation for both of the two substances. And a good way to think about that is these molecules are leaping out of solution into the gas phase more readily than they otherwise would, right? They have a higher vapor pressure. So in a sense, they don't like each other. The mixing interaction is unfavorable in some way, and they'd rather be in the gas phase. So in an effort to uh, give you a chance to think more about that, here's our very quick self-assessment, uh, taking a look at one of these positive deviations. And here's the explanation behind that one. I'll give you a minute to pause the video and read up on it. Now, in addition to positive deviations from Raoul's law, it's also possible to have negative deviations from Raoul's law. So here's another pressure composition. Now chloroform and acetone, more pleasant smelling substances, frankly. Um, again, Raoul's law is shown here. Were it to be followed, you would expect to see these vapor pressure lines as a function of composition. And that would be the ideal behavior following Raoul's law. Instead, the vapor pressure is lower than would be predicted for each of the two components at a given composition. And so again, there's a, a fairly straightforward way to think about this. The actual interactions that derive from having mixed the molecules are favorable in some sense and are holding the molecules into the liquid more than they would be than if they were in their own pure substances. So they like each other if we were to anthropomorphize these molecules. These deviations from ideality allow us to uh, define a new law that will prove very important, and it's called Henry's Law. So Raoul's law, you'll remember, is that the pressure of component J, its vapor pressure, is just the pure liquid vapor pressure times the mole fraction. And as the component itself approaches purity, when we look at these various vapor pressure curves, we do see an asymptotic approach to Raoul's law type behavior. All right, and so I've drawn this blue line here, which overlaps the black line. It's Raoul's law. And you see, here's carbon disulfide. So this is mole fraction carbon disulfide. It is coming in and approaching that line asymptotically. There's a different asymptote, though, over at the other end. And so as I reduce the carbon disulfide to near infinite dilution, if I assume linear behavior of the vapor pressure, I can draw a different line here. And that's what assume linear behavior means. I'm just taking the slope as I get near infinite dilution. Um, that defines the behavior of the vapor pressure early on. So Henry's law says that the vapor pressure of a component 
is linear in the mole fraction, but instead of the linearity being with the slope of the pure substance, it's by a slope called Henry's constant. So that's what this k subscript h for Henry, comma j for the jth component, as xj goes to zero, so it's at the dilute end. So dilute slope defines the Henry's law constant. It's not equal to the pure substance vapor pressure. And a trivial way to see that is that, remember, this run is one. So if the slope here with a pure vapor pressure, that's this line. And it goes up to the pure vapor pressure. Here, apparently, the Henry's law constant is greater than the pure vapor pressure. Because if I were to extend this out to one, well, it goes off the screen here. It's a very large number. And so a way to think about what Henry's constant tells you is, let's think about what really happens at very low concentrations of one. So it's no surprise that at high concentrations of one, as it becomes almost a pure liquid, you know, every one molecule pretty much sees another one molecule. So of course, its vapor pressure follows Raoul's law. It looks like pure one. But by the time I'm down at infinitely dilute, instead of being surrounded by other ones, I'm pretty much entirely surrounded by twos. So the Henry's constant is telling you more about how molecule one is interacting with molecule two than it does with molecule one. In fact, Raoul's and Henry's laws are, uh, one dictates the other. So the Henry's law behavior of component two as its mole fraction goes to zero is actually a thermodynamic consequence of the Raoul's law behavior of one as its mole fraction goes to one, right? Those two are coupled. If, if mole fraction of one is going to one, mole fraction of two is going to zero. So I actually want to prove that because I think it's important and it, it illustrates a, a use of chemical potentials. So let, let's start there. So the chemical potential of any component is the standard state chemical potential, one bar for instance, plus RT log, the vapor pressure. That's for an ideal vapor. And so now when I take the differential of that, so d mu for any component, and I'll, I'll keep track now of one and two, it's going to be RT. This, this is a number, by the way, right? That's, that's a standard state number. You'd look it up in a book. Maybe it's 25. So there's no derivative for 25. The only thing that can be differentiated is here. And I'm going to differentiate with respect to mole fraction. Right? So RT, here's the thing that depends on mole fraction, the pressure. But remember from the gibbs duhem equation, I have a way to relate chemical potentials and mole fractions. So here are my expressions for chemical potential. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to substitute. When I make that substitution into the gibbs duhem equation, so I'm actually going to go back here for a moment. So I'm going to take this, and I'm going to plug it in here. I'm going to take this, and I'm going to plug it in there. So now I get x1 times d mu. I've, I've actually divided both sides by RT. So some RTs went away because there was a 0 over here. It was easy to divide by RT. And then I'm again going to exploit that the mole fraction relates x1 and x2. So I know that dx1 is minus dx2. So I can move this over. I'm going to take this as negative uh, dx1 move it over to the other side so it becomes positive. There's a dx1 on both sides. They go away. I'm left with x1 partial log p1 partial x1 equals x2 partial log p2 partial x2. And when we're going to make one of these go to ideality, so pressure, pressure, this should probably say, sorry, when mole fraction of one is going to one, it's becoming ideal, so pressure one is going to x1, p1 star. So I'll plug that in. I'm going to replace log of p1 with log of x1, p1 star. Okay, well, that's easy to take the partial derivative with respect to x1 of. So log of x with respect to x, I get 1 over x. This is a product. p1 star is a number, so when I take partial of that number, I get nothing. So I get x1 times 1 over x1. So it's 1. So this thing on the left-hand side is 1. All right, so just emphasizing that. So let me substitute that again. Here I have it making it equal to 1. I'll now 
collect my uh, mole fraction 2 over on one side. So I get partial log P2 equals 1 over X2, partial X2. I'm going to take an indefinite integral of both sides. So log P2 equals log X2 plus an integration constant. There's an integration constant on both sides. I'll collect them up into 1. And finally, I'm going to say let's, let's give that constant sort of a different name. Let's call it the Henry's constant. In particular, the Henry's constant will be e to the c, whatever that arbitrary constant is. It'll depend on substances. So then I would write this as log p2 equals log x2 plus log kh2, right? If, if kh2 is equal to e to the c, then uh, log kh2 is c. So I got a sum of logs. That lets me write a log of products. And when I take the anti-log of both sides, I finally arrive at p2 is equal to x2 times kh2. And that, that's what we were trying to prove, basically, that the act of substituting in Raoul's law for component 1, which is what we did on the last slide, requires that the behavior of component 2 follow this relationship, that x2 times kh2. So again, I'm going to give you a chance to think more deeply about the Henry's constant in particular. So take a look at these questions and try to answer them. And Okay, I'm actually going to talk through this one. So again, while I usually leave these to be read because they tend to be self-explanatory, this one is so important, I think I'll spend a moment on it. First off, mole fraction is a dimensionless number. And so if I've got pressure is equal to mole fraction times something, that something must have units of pressure. And so KH2 must have units of pressure. It's, it's most handy, actually, to think about what if it were an ideal solution? That is, what if it followed Raoul's law behavior? Well, in that case, here's the, the slope of the line that is multiplying mole fraction. As we've talked about, the beauty of mole fraction is the run is 1. So the slope of Raoul's law behavior is the vapor pressure of the pure substance. So if you like, Raoul's law behavior, or an ideal solution, happens when the Henry's law constant, which tells you the slope of the early vapor pressure, is equal to the pure substance vapor pressure. So KH2 equals P, am I using one or two here? One, two, I guess I'm using two. Equals P2 star. Right? If I have a positive deviation, my slope, this red line, that's what's shown on this curve, that's greater than the Raoul's law behavior. So KH2 must be greater than P2 star. Were I to have a negative deviation, that would be down here, I have a slope that's smaller than P2 star. So Henry's constant will be smaller than, uh, than P2 star. And so that, that really is what Henry's constant tells you to some extent, is you know, when it's larger than the pure substance vapor pressure, I know that I have positive deviation. My molecules don't like each other. When it's smaller, I know that I have negative deviation. And they do like each other. And one can work out that this will, because we know that Raoul's law behavior at one end requires Henry's law behavior at the other, it's true for the other one, too. So you end up with these diagrams that always look the same, either positive or negative. OK. Well, that takes us through kind of some of the key concepts with non-ideal solutions. We're going to let the train keep moving down the tracks. The next time, we're going to look at some interesting phenomena, azeotropes and immiscible phases.